Howdy fans of this channel. Now time for something completely different again. Um, not going to talk about what I usually talk about on this channel. Going to talk about, going to take up kind of where I left off last time uh, with uh, one of my favorite places uh, in whole wide world there. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, the book that, that I was in there, uh, because I was at my favorite place. And I got to, uh, thinking that's kind of hard when you're an old guy. <sighs> when it was when I first started going uh, to that place where I ran into the guy that was writing the book. And of course, by that I mean Shiloh. And had the book for you last time. I looked around through all my... Civil War junk, and I found the uh, the postcard that I wrote myself, and uh, without giving away where I used to live, let's see, you might be able to see that uh, it says, what does it say? It says, April 6, 95. Weather superb. I was interviewed by a guy writing a book. More later. Well, there you go. Proof that I was there. And uh, as I was uh, talking to my uh, younger brother today, we were talking about that, uh, that entranceway right there into the Shiloh Park. Because that uh, particular one does not exist anymore in that fashion. Uh, where we used to go into the park early in the morning. But, why? Why a Civil War battlefield uh, park, national park, uh, why it's so endearing to me, I'm... I don't know, and I was, like I said, I was trying to figure out when the first time was that I went to, uh, to Shiloh. Uh, I know what was happening uh, around that time, so uh, I know it was either 1986 or 1987. I'm leaning more towards 87, uh, even though I don't, you know, I'm thinking more towards 87 uh, when that was the first time I went through uh, Shiloh as an adult on my way back from Memphis. And uh, it just got me right away. I mean, uh, it's it's like laid out where as you walk around, you understand what's going on in and, uh, and Shiloh. Okay. Give everybody a little background about uh, Shiloh. It was a, a battle in western Tennessee, uh, just above Mississippi. Uh, if you know where Corinth, Mississippi is, if you go north from there, then uh, you end up someplace around the Shiloh battlefield. It's also known as Pittsburgh Landing. Um, the north usually called their battles one thing, and the south sometimes called them another thing usually. Um, based on different things around the battlefield and uh, Pittsburgh Landing was the name of where the battlefield uh, touches the Tennessee River and there was a landing there and that's where troops were coming, uh, Union troops were coming uh, up river to um, get south and have a landing place and a gathering place. Now you think up river going south? Yes, yes. Uh, in that, on that part of the Tennessee River, it flows northward. So going up river is heading south. So anyway, um, and that's why they call it Pittsburgh Landing. Well, it was already called Pittsburgh Landing there because there had already been a landing there for uh, uh, boats to unload goods. There's a um, gradual incline that goes from uh, where the river is 
the, the Tennessee River and where a plateau um, is up in that area and where they could get to the road that would take them to the western part of the river, I mean on the western side of the river. So anyway, so lots of uh, Union troops are building up there. About 40,000 or so Union troops under Ulysses S. Grant uh, started to encamp in that area. Um, Grant also had another division other than all the troops that were in the Pittsburgh Landing area. Um, he had another group of soldiers, about 7,000 or so, that were uh, north up in Savannah, uh, Tennessee. So, uh, as the more troops come, uh, they, the, of course, the first troops to get there were the Union veteran troops, and they were around the Pittsburgh Landing area, and as um, the newer troops got there, some of them very, very new, uh, some of them had just been sworn in a week, couple of weeks before, um, but they were there and learning how to use their weapons and uh, some of them camping out, you know, with other people for the first time. I mean, they been around other people for the first time. So they're getting used to soldiering and... Uh, like I said, there are about 40,000 of them, but the ones that got there last get pushed out furthest away from the river. And that's going to come into uh, to play here in just a little bit. Now, the Southern Army, the Confederates, they were looking to protect Corinth, Mississippi, because Corinth had a uh, railroad that went through it, that went from Memphis through Corinth, where there was a um, um, railway that went south to Mobile and then through Mississippi. Uh, um, and then there was um, the rail that kept going east, went through my hometown of Huntsville, Alabama, and then up uh, through Chattanooga and then down to uh, Atlanta and then out to the sea. Of course, the Union Army wants to disrupt that uh, uh, railway to disrupt any flow of supplies one way or the other. <clears throat> As you study the uh, Civil War, you know that it's a, a big war about uh, railways and rivers. You know, they're trying to control the rivers and uh, deny the use of railways to other troops because that's how they're moving supplies and troops very quickly around for the first time uh, in warfare. So, all these troops are uh, gathering up in, uh, uh, up in the Pittsburgh landing area and they're also going to be joined by another army of about uh, 15, 17,000 Union troops under a fellow named Don Carlos Buell. The Confederates want to get there before those two armies have a chance to get together. So what happens is, uh, the, like I said, the commander of the Union forces is Ulysses S. Grant, the commander of the Southern forces that are gathering in the Corinth area to attack the Union forces are led by Albert Sidney Johnston, and he was well thought of uh, in the South and in the, uh, in the North. He had been an Indian fighter out in uh, Texas and had his own claim to fame. Um, but he was in command of the uh, Western forces uh, called the Army of Mississippi. And uh, there's old Sidney right there. Albert Sidney Johnston from Texas. I had a cat named Sidney one time that was named for, for uh, 
for that one. Also had another uh, orange cat uh, that was named for another Confederate general. <laughs> sort of. But uh, anyway, I, I get off point. So, where was I? So Sidney was uh, gathering troops and he also had a, a, another general that worked for him uh, uh, by the name of uh, PTG, P, P G T Beauregard, and that was Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard. He was from New Orleans, and uh, he was uh, well thought of in the uh, Confederacy and was the second in command of the Western Army for the Confederacy. And that's going to come in uh, important here, unfortunately. The uh, Southern Army starts moving north, and uh, they almost call off the, uh, the attack that they had planned um, because, for one, it was taking a long time in the rain. Uh, another was their soldiers were new. They didn't know how to act like soldiers yet. This is uh, 1862, spring, April 6th and 7th of 1862. It's one year into the war. There's still a lot of non-veterans. Uh, a lot of uh, militias are being called up. So these guys, they haven't been Army yet. And a lot of them are trying out their rifles for the first time those that were lucky enough to not be going into combat with a shotgun or a hunting rifle. So, uh, uh, the, these guys were making lots of noise. And some of the uh, reconnaissance scouts of the Union forces had uh, gone back to their generals, like General Sherman, and said that, uh, hey, there's rebel activity out there. And uh, Sherman says... <laughs> If if there's rebels out there, you 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 just if they're that close, you can just take your uh, regiment back to Ohio, is what he told one guy. But uh, there were, and uh, uh, the Confederates were able to successfully sneak up onto uh, the lines of the Union soldiers early in the morning of the sixth of April, eighteen sixty-two. And like I said, all these new soldiers had been pushed to the uh, uh, out, outer parts of the encampment. So they were the ones that were going to take the brunt of the beginning of, uh, of the combat early, early in the morning there. And it was, it was bloody right off from the start. You know, but... Uh, for me, when I go there, that's there's a special place there that uh, where the uh, battle starts, and so uh, uh, whether my brother's with me or or whomever, uh, we always start uh, there, and then uh, start looking for different ways to explore the uh, the battlefield on the first day from there. Give me just a second. Okay, I had to wet my whistle there a little bit. Uh, where was I? So, the uh, Confederate troops are uh, all on the outskirts there of the uh, Union forces. Now, uh, a fellow by the name of um, uh, Prentice sent out uh, uh, a Union scouting force under a fellow named Peabody. And uh, Peabody was out there with uh, a couple of his regiments there early in the morning, and they well, they bump into uh, Confederate skirmishers. So the battle starts early in the morning, uh, six, you know, dawn breaking is, uh, is when it actually uh, gets going there. And it, it looks like it's just going to be a southern route. They just push back and push back because they're pushing through uh, green troops that uh, aren't doing a very good job of... Uh, staying and fighting and they push back and push back but then uh, uh, the south the the uh, northern troops start getting collected 
you know, where they can fight in pockets. And one of the uh, most heavy pockets is uh, called the hornet's nest. And uh, that's the deal I used on the, uh, the intro there for, uh, for the Shiloh, my favorite battlefield, is, uh, is I think that's the same thing there. And uh, it's real popular. Thing. And this, to segue, is uh, one of the first uh, battlefield brochures that I ever got. And it's copyrighted 1987. So uh, uh, other things that uh, I'm finding around me also lead me to believe that uh, the first time that I was there at Shiloh was in 1987. Now, of course, this gives, make sure I'm holding it uh, the right way. There we go. Gives a driving map of how to get around. And that's what we used for a long, long time. Until, I don't know if you recall uh, uh, Tony Horowitz in the, in the book there, uh, uh, Confederates in the Attic, mentioned a map. And that's this deal right here. And I got this uh, puppy quite a while ago. Let's see, uh, uh, 94 is what this one says. But, um, and I saw uh, Horowitz in 95. But this has, this, this is big. I mean, it folds out really big and all of these uh, little numbers and slashes and everything on there <clears throat> show where uh, monuments that different states put up, different uh, 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 organizations and then also markers, monuments and markers um, and the markers have a couple of different configurations and a couple of different colors. Um, now, the way the reason they do that is because, like I said, the battle started early in the morning of the um, 6th of April and they push in and uh, Union troops fall back uh, during that day. Uh, except for a place where they uh, hold on tight at the hornet's nest and then uh, they're able to at the end of the night uh, rally around what's called Grant's last line and uh, that ends the first day and then there's a second day of battle where the uh, Union troops with the help of uh, troops that have come across overnight uh, been ferried across the Tennessee River uh, Don Carlos Buell's uh, troops, they're able to push back and basically take all the land back that the uh, uh, Confederates had taken the day before. So it's it's a uh, northern victory because they keep the South from doing what they needed to do, and what the South needed to do was destroy Grant's army while it was separated from Buell's army. So they didn't accomplish that. So uh, there's, they couldn't really uh, take a whole lot of uh, win from that battle. But the reason that I uh, mentioned that along with the uh, markers, the monuments will also tell you a lot of information about where that unit was fighting, what day it was, and all that. But the markers are these just... Uh, steel uh, plaques that have legs and they come in three colors red for confederate troops southern troops uh, of the army of mississippi and, and then there's also blue markers and those are grant's army of the tennessee is named, his army was named after the Tennessee River because that's what they were using to head south. So uh, his army of the Tennessee, 
there's our blue. And then Buell, who comes along mostly on the second day, his are yellow. His army is called the Army of the Ohio, of the Ohio River. And so uh, his smaller army was uh, coming down to support Grant, coming down from um, Nashville that had already uh, capitulated and was under occupation. So, before those two could get together was when uh, Johnson wanted to strike. Now back to mon uh, markers, you'll see a couple of different shapes of, mon of markers out there. And um, one of them is big rectangle and it has a lot of information on it about big uh, armies and how they're split up and all that sort of stuff. But then there are a regular size rectangular um, marker in red and in blue and some in yellow and those are all first day markers and then um, second day markers in red and blue and a lot more yellow are the sec uh, oval shaped markers and these markers tell you where a um, uh, division or brigade happened to be at a certain time and because they uh, a lot of the veterans helped to put these markers there uh, to make sure they were in the right place uh, a lot of them are there there because of uh, the records that uh, everyone was able to keep and uh, that way, if you if you want to, like my brother and I have, you can pick out a certain unit, one that you may think is the unit your family would have fought in, say, if you still lived, if you lived in that place at that time. And ours was always, uh, oh, what, the uh, 17th, 18th, 19th Alabama because they were raised in northern Alabama and so we was kind of went with that uh, at the uh, Battle of Shiloh they fought under the uh, brigade command of uh, I do believe at the time he was Colonel uh, Joseph uh, Wheeler I don't know if y'all are uh, familiar with Wheeler he uh, served after the war as a um, uh, senator from Alabama, I do believe. And uh, there's a big area uh, in North Alabama around where he lived, uh, this uh, well, wildlife refuge that's also part of the TVA and one of the um, uh, dams there that's part of the TVA is uh, Wheeler Dam, and also uh, after being a Confederate general, uh, like I said, he served in uh, Congress or the Senate. I would have to look real quick to find out. And then when the War of uh, Spanish-American War came along in 1898. He was obliged to serve, give his services again, and so uh, he fought for the Union, for the United States Army uh, in Cuba. So uh, there you go. He was, uh, I do believe, he was an uh, officer um, in the same army and area as um, Teddy Roosevelt. So. Uh, Great movie about that called Rough Riders and everything. Uh, although I think uh, the fellow who plays uh, Joseph Wheeler is a little bit over the top. But still, uh, you get an idea there at Shiloh about how he got started. Uh, we've uh, followed that area uh, and that way of, of which way the battle went uh, several times because we have that uh, map and we could find all of the markers and uh, find the uh, 
Wheeler Monument and things like that that would show us the way of where we figured our forebearers, for people before us that probably weren't uh, any uh, relation to us, but still, we went with it. <clears throat> so anyway, so uh, let me take another break, and what I'm going to do is, uh, in this break, is show you a little video, and this video is from uh, 1996, so this is a year after, uh, after the the writer guy, uh, exactly a year, because it was uh, I was there again on the uh, anniversary as I had done uh, quite often for the previous eight or nine or ten years, however uh, long we're going to figure out it was. But uh, this time uh, I had a friend with me and uh, just be able to show you, uh, I used my mom's VHS, old big old clunky VHS uh, recorder camera there, shoulder mounted to, uh, to uh, get the footage there and, uh, and you may see some other people there clunking around with their uh, big VHS cameras because there was uh, um, a ceremony that day. Uh, and I'll have to include part of that too, but there's a whole lot of uh, uh, scenes of just open area and monuments and markers and you'll see the what I'm talking about with the square ones and the oval ones and the red ones and the blue ones. Maybe you'll see a couple of yellow ones and give you an idea of what uh, what Shiloh was about it's changed a lot since uh since the first video that i'll show you uh you know it's it's changed a lot and then i'll come back and there's going to be another video after that that was taken just a few years ago so anyway thanks for suffering through so far remember we're uh, uh to the hornet's nest uh, uh basically the hornet uh, nest is where the Union soldiers uh, hold out for as long as they can before finally uh, having to uh, uh, give up uh, one of the reasons because they hadn't been uh, reinforced. Now, uh, two of the uh, division commanders, divisional uh, commanders in the Grant's army are both named Wallace. And so you'll have to, uh, you know, kind of remember that if you decide to delve deeper into here. One was uh, W. H. L. Wallace. <sighs> he does not fare too well on the first day, and uh, it's all—it's uh, kind of a romantic uh, parting how he goes because his uh, wife was planning to show up and surprise him. And Wallace was just gonna show up and say, "Hey, honey, here I am, and uh, and let me uh, uh, help make your bed in your tent there, and and do your wash for you, and everything, and uh, and that'll just be great." And before she could uh, uh, see him, he uh, got wounded badly, badly uh, during the battle around the Hornet's Nest, and. Uh, he did not make it, but she was able to find him still hanging on to life out there uh, uh, after the battle and uh, was able to comfort him in his, uh, his uh, waning time. So, uh, you know, it's, I know that it's not very romantic, but, in, you know, it, it is when you think about it. And that was, was romantic times back then. People talked differently and thought differently. But anyway. Take a break. What's coming up is uh, anniversary of Shiloh in uh, 1996. So enjoy, and I will be right back. Because I'm not going to bore you with the whole 40, 50 minutes of it. I'm just going to cut it down real short and show you the good stuff. So, anyway.
that's a cold wind hitting me right in the face. Oh, my As you can see by the display, it is April 6, 1996. We are, hopefully you can tell where we're at, but we're at Fraley Field. And this way is, of course, Fraley Field. And you can see the lone marker out there. Let's do away with the display. Thank you. Whoa, that wind is uh, going to be something. Here we are at the two cabins. So you know that means that we've gotten inside the park and we're past the uh, Battle Begins sign. And of course, this is where Sydney made his famous uh, spool statement. Although I seem to think that it would be further on into uh, the battlefield. Further on down into the battlefield where there were some Union camps. We are to where the 25th finally backed up to. What do we have at about uh, 8 to 9 o'clock? What time do we have there, Em? What? what time do you have? Oh, so we're ahead here, ahead of them. But we are at the beginnings of Peabody Road, where Peabody Road runs into Rea Springs Road, and also where the Peabody Monument is over yonder. and the encampment of the 25th Missouri Infantry where he first sent them out. Oh, I hear we got company. We are on the other side of the road where Peabody got it. And tells about how the good guys are now overrunning the Yankee invaders camp and over here again we have the Peabody Monument where he finally took his last shot there. And Margaret taking a few shots of her own. See, even after 130 something years, Southerners are till, still taking shots of Peabody. Arc, arc. I'm going to do a little recording seeing how the sun's out. To tell everybody that it's a little bit after 8 o'clock and we have made a full circle as you can see over here is the two cabins signpost let me back away from it here there is the sunlit field let me get over here so you can see the Arkansas monument there I mean tablet Going back out here. And we'll see y'all in a little while. Okay, folks. We'll see what time it is. It is 9.46. And we are here at the Sydney Monument. Albert Sidney Johnston monument. It shows where he was mortally wounded. Let's see, General Albert Sidney Johnston commanding the Confederate Army was mortally wounded here at 2.30. Died in the ravine 50 yards southeast at 2.45. And we are headed for the ravine. Of course, they knew it was this spot here because it was next to this tree where the governor of Tennessee found him reeling in the saddle after he had been leading charges across the road at the Peach Orchard. Now, hold on to your heads. We're going to do this pan rather quickly. That's not our truck. And... 
If you can see those white bottomed uh, trees out there that look like they have something helping them hold up that are not in bloom, that's the peach orchard. And the Yankees were amongst and behind the peach orchard. And if I step over this way a little bit, there it is. You can see the George Mann's cabin that was right in the middle of things. But at the time of the battle, the peach orchard was in full bloom with all of its pink blossoms. Unfortunately, it isn't today, although I have been here on occasion when it was, and it looks real nice. Oh, a person down the trail. Yep, there's that tree. Been there for 132 years at least. There during the battle, the boy come back from making that charge and the governor says, are you wounded? And Sidney says, yes, I fear seriously. And so they took him off the horse and led him down this here trail. we happened to run into another happy camper this morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, how you doing? Oh, fairly fair. It's a hallowed piece of ground. Yes, sir. Do, 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 do. Bad thing about looking through the viewfinder, you could trip on something and fall over and break mom's camera. Oh, that wouldn't make anybody happy. And here we have it, folks. Sidney Johnston commanding the Confederate Army. Folks, this is it. This is one of my favorite spots on earth. Folks, as miserable as this looks, I know, don't be too depressed, this is the peach orchard. Mm -hmm. Something must have happened. That's all I can say. As soon as I see a, a park ranger, I will be sure to ask what the f happened to the peach orchard. Well, maybe not exactly that, but what happened to it? Does not look like it's here anymore, folks. Dang, the sun is reflecting off the cannonballs over there, over at Sydney's Monument. Over in that direction. Oh, okay. I'm not really pointing at it. There it is. Oh, it looks kind of keen. I hope it comes out on the film because it looks like they're either on fire or sparklers or something in black and white.
more time, folks, believe it or not. That, unfortunately, is the peach orchard. Here we are on the other side of the George Mann's cabin. And the far side of the peach orchard over there. There's Margaret laying down taking pictures of grass. But it is so nice and green. Oh, and the sky is so nice and blue and cloud, puppy clouds. The camera is hanging off of a hook on the front of a cannon. Let's see if I can get it balanced a little better there. Ooh. Oh, look at you. Let's see here. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. Whoa, and now the wind's going to blow it around. Whoa. <laughs> I better quit messing around. Well, once I got it on there, the wind started blowing it around. Here we are at the old BP station. Everything looks nice and calm today. Margaret drops her stick. And there go the Boy Scouts. Good riddance. Okay, this is the burial trench between Shiloh Church and Raya Springs. And I would say the reason that it's decorated today is because of the uh, commemorative ceremony and memorial flags that they're going to be putting up in, uh, at the biggest trench. So this makes two of the trenches you've seen. I think there's five of them here. This flag down here on the end is going to be the one that they're going to be raising over the other one. This flag in the middle is, of course, the most uh, easily recognizable Confederate battle flag. The blue one, blue one right there is called a Polk flag, a Tennessee flag. And the one back in the back corner there is the Bonnie Blue flag that bears the single star. Hurrah, hurrah for Southern rights, hurrah, hurrah for the Bonnie Blue flag that bears the single star. National flag, the Department of the Mississippi battle flag, and of course the Hardy Claiborne flag down there on the very end. And of course, this is the largest of the, I think, five burial trenches in which they're having a memorial today.
make it a seven. enjoy that um, that was like I said 1996 uh, after I had been uh, already been coming to the park for oh at least eight or nine years or so as you can see from the the patches there on the old uh, army jacket there uh, some of the most important ones are the uh, Two of the Shiloh ones, and like I showed you last time, the, uh, the other Shiloh one that I've picked up. Let's see, I got one here that says uh, Pittsburgh Landing on it. And let's pick back up with uh, with Pittsburgh Landing. Uh, like I said, it was a place where boats could dock and unload more troops uh, that had marched down from. Uh, Nashville to the eastern side of the Tennessee River and they needed to just have boats to shuttle them back and forth across and uh, <clears throat> after the hornet's nest fell Grant knew that that line had to be maintained there so they could be resupply and, and get fresh troops in so uh, he set up all of his artillery there uh, on what's called now called Grant's last line and it uh, was fortified all the troops fell back to that line uh, they were able to be reinforced from Pittsburgh Landing um, I never explained uh, sh the Shiloh part of it some of the Union camps were out around a little, sh a little uh, Methodist church by the name of Shiloh, uh, Sherman's troops, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, for those who aren't that familiar with uh, Civil War stuff, but uh, his troops were around this little uh, Methodist meeting house by the name of Shiloh, and Shiloh is uh, Hebrew, <coughs> ironically enough, for place of peace, which for those two days in April 1862, it was not a very peaceful place. Um, of course, that was one of the areas that uh, that the Union troops were shoved out of, uh, which has always kind of uh, uh, made me laugh now that I look back at um, an old movie, one of my favorite, uh, um, How the West Was Won. There's about 10 minutes of it where they're supposedly at Shiloh. And uh, when they talk about the Shiloh meeting house, they make you think that the place where they have the field hospital is in the Shiloh meeting house, the Union Field Hospital, which the Shiloh meeting house was under the control of, of the Southern troops by that time, uh, Ray of Springs and all that uh, Western area of the uh, battlefield was uh, under control of uh, Confederate troops during the night of April 6th. So uh, as troops fell back, they fell uh, back behind the uh, hornet's nest and uh, there was a pond there that 
is there sometimes, sometimes it's not. Uh, it's one of those depends on how hard it rains type ponds. Uh, but that uh, evening, the uh, pond turned red. Well, kind of a pinkish, brackish pinkish color because so many uh, soldiers got to it and with their dying breath tried to get a drink, fell into it, bled into it. Oh. First day of uh, Shiloh was just, it, it was crazy. It was, it was a slaughter on both sides. Uh, like I said, there were not that many uh, veteran soldiers from the first year of the war. There were, you know, officers that had seen combat in the Mexican War, but uh, that was a long time ago. And uh, they were leading people who had never seen combat and uh, hoping that they would fight in uh, Napoleonic formation. And that was one of the things that went uh, wrong right off the bat for the uh, Confederates is that uh, General Beauregard talked uh, Johnson into lining them up in these formations that stretched them out and they weren't really able to support each other and that's one of the reasons why the hornet's nest happened was because uh, when the Union troops started putting up a, a strong even though disorganized fight um, they were still uh, massing their firepower whereas the uh, uh, Beauregard was sending or should I say brag uh, on the orders of Beauregard was uh, sending in troops piecemeal. He would send in regiments, a couple of regiments at a time to charge against this uh, maybe not fortified area but heavily defended. So uh, uh, it took a lot of these uh, failed attempts on the Confederates part to uh, figure out a way to get around the uh, the hornet's nest and attack it from behind, and that was what part of the troops that uh, that we always pretend that we're with uh, the uh, 17th, 18th, 19th Alabama with uh, fighting Joe Wheeler. Uh, you know they they got around uh, the <clears throat> what would be the left side of the Union and uh, Union line and tried to cut them off from from the Tennessee River and uh, a lot of those troops were captured you know uh, that's one of the reasons why the captured numbers uh, sway heavily against the uh, Union side uh, like I said both sides have maybe 40,000 to start off with um, the Union gets 5,000 or so uh, captured, whereas the uh, South, they only through the whole battle, they get less than a thousand captured. So uh, um, the Union forces get depleted quickly, but so do the Confederate forces in all the attacking that they're doing. It took them longer to get up uh, to the battlefield from Corinth, Mississippi than they thought. A lot of guys were stopping in the Union encampments to fill up with food and coffee and whatever. Um, so, you know, that leads to disorganization. Plus, at the battle uh, around the Hornet's Nest, there's an area called a Peach Orchard. And uh, you I probably made reference to it there in the video about the Peach Orchard. And then, so you know what's coming next, Albert Sidney Johnston, my guy here, does not make it. He leads the arm, the, the general of the whole army leads attacks on the Peach Orchard, on the stubborn resistance the Union soldiers are putting up there. So uh, somewhere along the way, he gets wounded. His wound is a uh, small nick. I've, I always read just a, a, a little wound, but in a bad place in the back of his leg, and it uh, severs an artery. And he uh, bleeds down his leg into his boot, 
and so nobody sees blood. And then the um, governor of Tennessee was there on the battlefield with him, and uh, he goes over to him and goes, are you okay? Because he'd seen the general there kind of waving back and forth in the uh, saddle of his horse there, and uh, and Johnson goes, no, I, I think I've been wounded seriously. And uh, so they take him off the horse and, as the video shows, hopefully, uh, down the ravine there where he dies. And so it's left to Beauregard and his grandiose schemes of uh, Napoleonic dreams um, that don't happen and don't happen the way he thought they should. And so uh, fighting stalls out. Uh, the uh, Union guys are able to uh, maintain their Grant's last line there. Uh, the other Wallace is able to come down from, uh, from the northern encampment he's got around uh, uh, Savannah and Crumpton up there. And uh, the reason I mentioned him is his name Lou. Hey, Lou. Lou Wallace. You go, oh, who's Lou Wallace? Lou Wallace was a general in the Civil War. And uh, even though he uh, kind of got uh, his reputation tarnished by getting himself lost uh, during the Battle of Shiloh when his, uh, he and his command could have been uh, used to much advantage, uh, he went on later in the war uh, to regain some of that respect at the uh, Battle of uh, Monocacy, I think. Uh, but anyway, he went on to serve as uh, um, territorial governor of the New Mexico Territory uh, during the time that uh, Billy the Kid was uh, running wild in that area. And he also, in his spare time, wrote a little book that you might be familiar with because of it's been made into a movie a couple of three at least three times I know of for sure. The name of the book was Ben Hur, A Tale of Christ. So there you go. He gave uh, Charles Heston one of his biggest uh, roles he ever had. Of course, I think a silent version was made, and uh, and uh, of course the big one that everybody else remembers, but uh, with the chariot race and all that stuff. Well, that all came from a um, Civil War general that fought at the Battle of Shiloh. So, he gets to where he needs to be there at uh, um, uh, Pittsburgh Landing. And to get to Pittsburgh Landing, he has to cross over Owl Creek. The reason I throw this one in is because uh, uh, amongst his uh, soldiers were uh, was a, a reporter by the name of Ambrose Bierce. And Ambrose Bierce wrote a lot of short stories later, uh, and one of them is called An Occurrence at Owl Creek. And uh, there's a Twilight Zone uh, episode. It's become a Twilight Zone episode. It wasn't originally, but, uh, but that's how we see it these days. So if you ever get a chance, uh, check out uh, Occurrence at Owl Creek. So, the Union side's been reinforced over uh, the night of the 6th, the morning of the 7th, and they're ready to bust out fighting. Uh, like uh, um, Grant said to Sherman as they were uh, making plans for the next day, he said, lick them tomorrow, which he meant, you know, we're going to have enough soldiers where we're going to be able to go back and kick their patooties there. And he was right, because the, the South, where they were equal with the uh, Union uh, troop totals there at the beginning of the day, they weren't that night. And they didn't get reinforcements. They didn't have somebody coming from Nashville or Corinth or any place to reinforce them. And that's why Johnston knew that he needed to cut uh, Grant off and destroy his army there during the battle on the first day. It didn't happen. They uh, basically started up the uh, 
the battle the next day. A lot of uh, the Southerners were kind of surprised that, oh, oh we're going to have to fight today. I thought we beat them yesterday, you know, and that would be it. They'd go home. But they didn't. Uh, reorganized troops, fresh troops uh, came back out onto the battlefield. And it was just a matter of, not an easy matter, because a lot more casualties were to come that second day and all those oval um, uh, marker spots that you see on the battlefield, you know, still a lot of casualties to come even on the second day. And um, they pushed back the, uh, the Confederate soldiers and uh, they, there's a swampy area that uh, there's a lot of actually monuments out around it simply because that's where a lot of uh, fighting happened as the, sold, the uh, Confederate soldiers slowly fell back because they had become disorganized. They had not been had their ammunition replenished. All those sort of things that uh, make it impossible to continue to fight a battle. So they uh, um, fell back, Breckenridge covered them with a uh, rear guard with uh, uh, reserves. Breckenridge, don't know if you know this one, but he had been a vice president uh, of the United States at one time before the war. So uh, you never know where a vice president will end up uh, after a couple of years. Oh, and um, the last of the, uh, the skirmishing that happened uh, on that uh, battlefield is at a place called Fallen Timbers. And uh, uh, a lot of people say that that was actually happened on the 8th, but uh, the last uh, uh, engagement between uh, troops of the Army of Mississippi, under now under Beauregard, and uh, troops uh, in the Army of Tennessee, of, excuse me, of the Tennessee and of the Ohio under uh, Grant and Buell, uh, they clashed for the last time and the last um, soldier to be wounded in the Battle of, of Shiloh was this guy, Nathan Bedford Forrest. I know this guy is hated by a lot of people. He's one of my heroes. He's, he's just so bad. I mean, okay. Uh, I showed you a patch last time of uh, Nathan Bedford Forest State Park. At the state park is where Johnsonville used to be, Johnsonville, Tennessee. But when uh, TVA came along, uh, the old Johnsonville, Tennessee got flooded. It just, they bought everybody out, uh, tore down a lot of the buildings, although I think people still scuba dive dangerously uh, into what used to be Johnsonville. But uh, at the old site of Johnsonville and the bluffs overlooking uh, that town that was a port on the Tennessee River, this guy, this guy, this badass right here <clears throat> with cavalry, with cavalry, captured naval boats. Don't have the time to tell that story right now. You might want to look it up yourself if you don't believe me. The boy captured Navy boats with cavalry. But like I said, he was uh, the last uh, fellow to get uh, wounded as he uh, charged the Union line by himself. Um, when they realized who he was and got ready to start shooting at him, uh, uh, he grabbed up one guy, one uh, scared Union soldier, who uh, uh, actually put his uh, musket up against uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest's side and shot a bullet into him that lodged up against his spine that I think he may have carried for the rest of his life. 
uh, along with I think a half dozen other wounds that he got during the war and like a uh, half dozen uh, horses shot out under him and and uh, he's just he's, he was just bad dude uh, you didn't want to mess with him um, later on in the war uh, in, in, within, in the last year he had an argument with a, a subordinate um, officer and uh, the guy, I think uh, uh, he, I think the guy sh stabbed Forrest and Forrest shot him, or maybe it was the other way around, I forget. But uh, uh, he, while he was getting uh, his wound tended to, he said, no, guy, no man shoots me and gets away with it. So I guess he stabbed him or something. Or, no man kills me and gets away with it. But he didn't kill him. But he didn't kill Forrest didn't get killed because Forrest is a badass and he out he outlived the war. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, there were also uh, Mississippi troops, and oddly enough, there were no uh, monuments on the Mississippi uh, for Mississippi troops anywhere on the battlefield for years and years and years and years. And the last video that I'll be uh, tagging on to the end here is of the last time that I went to Shiloh and it starts off by showing that new uh, monument to the soldiers from the south that fought to protect their home of Mississippi uh, you put in whatever you want to on top of that that uh, whatever they were fighting for that maybe they weren't but uh, the people of Mississippi um, in 2015, I uh, thought it was still important enough that they needed to have a monument uh, to the fighting men of Mississippi during the uh, Civil War. So they put one up there in Shiloh. And, uh, and it had only been up like a week or two or, or christened uh, for a week or two before I actually saw it. So it was a surprise. Uh, when I saw it, because having been there so many times before, hey, wow, something that wasn't there the last time that I was there. So uh, anyway, let me go ahead and show you that, and uh, then I'll get get back with you.
go. Welcome home, boys. Okay, I need to wind this up uh, because it's going to be a, an hour or more as it is. Um, but I appreciate you just letting me uh, run off at the mouth. 
I don't uh, have people around that I can usually just lay out all this Civil War stuff on. But it was uh, nice to think about it. And the more I think about it, the more I think, uh, yeah, it must have been like 87. Although, 87 or so, I guess, is the first time I went. Uh, I remember my first uh, book that I got shortly after was... Uh, was this book about Shiloh and uh, it came out in 1987 and bought it at the books a million so uh, I don't think I would have get it back there in place I don't think I would have purchased it in 86 if it didn't come out until 87 and like I in the oldest one of these, this is the oldest one of these. I've got, I've got a, dozens of these pamphlets, deals, for uh, going to the through the park. But this is the oldest one that I could find, and it it's uh, tr uh, copyrighted, 1987. So, uh, <sighs> maybe everybody's trying to tell me something. But uh, I also had other. Uh, little bits of evidence here and there uh, pointing out 87, 87, but sure wish I could go back again sometime soon. Like I said, the last time was in the uh, video that you just saw of 2015. Uh, yeah, just so many things. Like I said, I've been a Civil War buff since I was a kid. I, I don't know if you can see these or not. I tried to do it in the light uh, earlier and it kind of got blurry. But uh, these are trading cards from back then. And uh, they're kind of gory. I don't know if you can see that or not. That's one. But uh, we'll go ahead and skip over to some of the goriest ones like uh, uh, Gettysburg one where the two guys are bayoneting each other. Ooh and I, that was back when I was like uh, seven, eight years old, and chewing gum and uh, some Confederate money. Let's see. Oh, this guy's getting, whoops, getting rammed through. And one last one. And this one's called Fight to the Finish, Shiloh, Tennessee, April 7th, 1862, which would have been day two of the battle. Got a guy bloody down there on the ground. They didn't spare when it came to uh, the red ink on their uh, lithos there. And then on the back of it, it would have like a little newspaper article. I don't know if, let's see if you can see it that way. A little newspaper article dated to the uh, day of uh, whatever battle that they were talking about. This case, Shiloh, and it give a little bit about uh, Grant and uh, and whomever uh, Grant and Buell. And so, uh, actually, you know, even though it was gory, it still had some historical information on it. I think I might have said something uh, in the other video about uh, it'd be nice if kids these days, blah, 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 kids these days, uh, had toys that taught them something about history, uh, trading cards that taught them something about history instead of uh, Ninja Turtles and Jedi Knights and uh, Marvel whatever. No, but that's me. A lot of money's been made off all that junk, <laughs> so it's put food on the table. But like I said, I used to play with the with uh, with Civil War stuff, you know, because they wanted, I guess, whip a little history on us at the same time. Because history won't hurt you, folks. You know, it really won't. Uh, you just find out about it, and and you look at it, and you go. Dang, that's already happened. That's done. 
it can't hurt me now. So, uh, you know, find you a little bit of history. Maybe it's some sort of naval nautical history or more recently with uh, uh, aviation history or something like that. But history, find out about real people. They, they have amazing stories, uh, every bit as amazing as, as turtles and, and Jedis and, and that kind of stuff. So anyway, but I drone on. Maybe next time if there if I if I don't get a haircut soon, I guess there'll have to be another uh, a video and uh, I'll have to talk about something other than Shiloh. But Shiloh's my favorite battlefield. Uh, it was the first one I ever went to, like I said, and uh, and right now it's sitting on the last one that I've gone to. Uh, yeah, because I've been to it since I've been to uh, uh, Little Bighorn out, out here. But uh, I, I have other favorite Civil War battlefields, and maybe I'll, if I don't get to a barber soon, maybe I'll do a video on, uh, what would that be? Chickamauga? Gettysburg? I don't know. Vicksburg? There's a lot of them out there. I've been to a few of them because I like history. Like I said, check out history. It won't hurt you. It won't, it's, it's already happened. You know, all those uh, uh, French people already got their heads cut off. There ain't nothing you can do about it. You know, all the people uh, in the Civil War already died. There ain't nothing we can do about it. Except for maybe honor, remember that they did and remember it the right way. And that's the way you learn history. So go out and learn some. It won't hurt you.